propriety. Uh, and this is the title of the article. By Conant was a doctoral student of Ross Ashby at the University of Illinois. It was, every good regulator of a system must be a model of that system. What that means is you need statements linking cause and effect. Uh, in the case of the regulator, you need statements linking the temperature outside the room and the temperature inside the room, equations, and so forth. Uh, you need to know, if I do this, this will happen. If I do something else, that will happen. That's a model. It links cause and effect. If you don't have a model, you have no rational grounds for choosing. Now, Ashby once said, that this was the idea that he was looking for when he began his investigations in cybernetics. And I find that very surprising because it seems like a fairly obvious and straightforward statement. But in the article, Conan and Ashby say that people used to think that if you're studying a problem, building a model was one thing you could do you might do something else. But what they're saying is you always have to have a model. A mental model doesn't have to be a mathematical model, but there has to be a model. If you don't have a model, you have no links between cause and effect, so you don't have any understanding of the system. So just as in the case of, if you remember my description of purposeful behavior, that you have a conception of the system and a conception of the ideal system, and you want to have some links that allow you to change the existing system into the preferred system, that's the model. That's what explains purposeful behavior. That's what tells you how to go about achieving your goal. And this wasn't known uh, long ago. This article was published about 1970, late 1960s. Now, Jay Forster, who invented system dynamics, uh, has a corollary to this. Uh, although he never refers to the law of requisite variety. They're different fields, but it's, I think they're closely connected. Forster says the usefulness of a mathematical model should be judged in comparison not with an ideal model, but rather with the mental image which would be used instead. In other words, people, if you build a mathematical model, people can criticize it on the grounds, well, it doesn't predict exactly. And so Forster would say, well, how, what prediction would you have made using your own mental model? Uh, very frequently, the mathematical model can be, is better than the mental models. And the great advantage of a mathematical model is that it makes explicit what one's assumptions are so that you can lay out your conceptions of cause and effect, and let somebody challenge those things. So I've always thought of system dynamics modeling or any kind of computer modeling as the first step of a conversation as opposed to the way to end an argument. All right. Now I thought what I would do is to tell you about the amplification of regulatory capability or the amplification of intelligence. It sounds neat. The amplification of management capability. And to show you just how close this phenomenon is to basic processes in engineering. So I'm going to go through a hydraulic lift in a gas station and then a sound amplifier like you'd see at a rock concert and then the example of reading the president's mail, and then we'll go to regulating the global economy. So, let's say Ben Franklin, who had an interest in inventions, or Thomas Jefferson, were here, and um, they went to a gas station, and somebody drives in a car, which would, also, which would obviously be a matter of interest, and then they go over to the wall and they flip a little switch and the car goes up in the air. I might think, wow, how did that happen? Somebody just moved this little switch here and this big heavy car goes up in the air. That could be pretty remarkable 
to a person from 100, 200 years ago. But nowadays, we take it for granted. The way it works is as follows. You have a switch that uh, you just flip the switch, wires go down to a pump. The pump turns on, it's an air compressor, and it pushes air through a tube. And the air presses a hydraulic fluid. Well, now that's the characteristic of a fluid that exerts equivalent pressure in all directions. So it may be just a few pounds per square inch, but if you have a large piston, then you get a large force coming out of it. So down underneath the ground in the uh, service station, there's a big pool of hydraulic fluid with a large piston, and it's the size of the piston, the area of the piston that amplifies the pressure on the hydraulic fluid produced by the uh, uh, compressed air, and it moves the automobile up. So once you understand that, then the tiny amount of effort required to flip the switch and the huge amount of effort required to lift the car uh, doesn't seem so unusual because you have additional force or energy going into the pump, electrical engineering. So that's the way it works. Now let's go on to electrical power amplification. If you've been to a rock concert, you know there's somebody on stage um, speaking into a microphone, and there's this booming noise that goes out uh, through the stadium or the valley or whatever it might be. You say, how does that happen? Well, you have a signal from the microphone that in the old days of vacuum tubes, which is the way I learned it. Uh, it, it was like a valve that controls the flow of water. And you just open it and close it, and there's a flow of electricity. And this grid uh, can cut off the flow of electrons. It can regulate the way the electrons flow, just like a valve controlling the flow of water. So you end up with a larger signal coming out then going in, which you can then feed into another valve that controls an even larger flow of electricity, which gives you an amplification, and so on. And then you just put in as many stages as you want, and you get a large sound out at the other end. So electricity flows through a series of valves, and it converts the small signal in to a larger, by regulating a large flow of electricity. Okay, now you can do the same thing with the amplification of decision-making capability. Uh, this is basically what corporations are all about, that you get many people working together and doing things that one person can't do. But a simple example is as follows. Let's say a grade school child writes a letter to the President of the United States and receives a reply. That's the surprising part, receives a reply. How is that possible? The president is very busy. He's negotiating with foreign leaders. He's trying to get legislation through Congress. He's managing the deficit. How does he have time to write to a third grader off in Iowa? Well, of course, the answer is he doesn't. There's a staff of people in the White House who receive all these letters. They probably sit at computers and they say, you know, paragraph two and then paragraph 23 and then a uh, particular salutation and zip, off it goes. They stick it under the signature machine and uh, Susie off in Iowa gets a letter from the president on White House stationery and is greatly impressed. But once again, the variety is managed by the people who are producing these letters and there's probably somebody managing the letter writers. So that some letters that come in go to the Social Security people. If somebody threatens the president, that goes to the Secret Service, uh, et cetera. Most of it has to do with the president's opinions on certain issues, most likely. So you can get an amplification of decision-making capability 
by controlling the flow of a larger capability. <clears throat> now, I want to shift now to managing the global economy. I once was invited to a conference on managing the global economy. And I thought, I'm not an economist. I don't know anything about this. But then I thought, well, I'm a cybernetician. You know, it's just a simple matter of management. So I should be able to say something about the subject. So I came up with this little schema, which is based on the work of Stafford Beer, who said something close to this, but not in exactly these terms. You distinguish different quantities of variety so that in the case of football or soccer, uh, you have a case of complete hostility, meaning everybody on the other side is trying to defeat you. And you're, you're matched in terms of the number of players. And in war, you have soldiers on each side, sometimes the same number, sometimes not. And you have strategy and tactics and weaponry and so on. But you have a situation in which you have two teams and you assume complete hostility. And you have to match approximately the variety on each side. That is not always the case. For example, with crime control, you don't need to have one policeman for every citizen because not every citizen is breaking the law. Uh, so you have enough police to control the criminals or aberrant behavior, speeding, whatever it might be. Uh, but usually you can get by with about two cops per thousand citizens because you're not trying to control everything. You have relaxed your ambitions to controlling only illegal activities. OK, now let's assume you're trying to regulate an economy in a country. You're trying to regulate the behavior of business within the United States. You don't want to regulate everything, but there are some things you want to regulate, like price fixing, antitrust behavior, uh, false statements on accounting returns, uh, et cetera. Well, you can change the rules of the game, like the Enron case led to new laws that the Securities and Exchange Commission enforces or something along those lines. So every time there's a problem, usually you get a new law and a new set of regulators. Um, that's a further amplification of your regulatory capability because you're relying upon the companies to regulate each other most of the time, like Ford competes with General Motors in terms of the automobiles that are designed. All you're doing is regulating the way that Ford and General Motors compete by looking at environmental laws, uh, uh, Securities and Exchange Commission laws, occupational safety and health laws, et cetera. But you can if you want an even, oh, and if you do that, you get an amplification of about one in 640,000, my students estimated, the number of people in the Federal Trade Commission and the Justice Department that were engaged in antitrust activity. And they estimated the number of managers in the country and came up with one in about 640,000, which is once again an amplification of about a factor of 1,000, OK? So that by regulating less, you can regulate more, or you can influence more by about a factor of 1,000, which is pretty impressive. But we're still not up to the level of the global economy. Well, consider the Club of Rome and their study of the world. It focused on sustainability, the environment, population, pollution, and so forth, which was a very different set of variables than what you saw in the 50s and 60s, where we had ideological competition between the United States and the Soviet Union. Uh, my family subscribed to US News and World Report. And in that magazine, there were always maps of the world that showed the red areas, the blue areas, the pink areas, and the light blue areas. So you knew who the major bloc leaders were, and you knew who the alliances were and they would have 
pictures of airplanes and missiles and submarines and aircraft carriers.